Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. We, may I call you Mr. Speaker? That's how we do it where I come from. <laughs> um, it's a great pleasure to be here and standing at this place and taking in the glow of this room. I'm sure it reflects the Scottish Enlightenment, but I think it also reflects the hopes and aspirations of everyone who is committed to the fight for human rights, as you all are. And I think uh, to see you, the young faces in particular, as part of this glow gives us energy and gives us hope um, and gives us inspiration. So thank you for being here. Thank you for doing what you do. Uh, we're working together in a noble cause, um, and we shall prevail. So what I'm here today to do uh, is to explain the work of the mandate of the Special Representative. But first, of course, let me thank uh, the Scottish Parliament, um, Alan, for the excellent work that you do, uh, Navi um, and Mary. Um, none of this would be happening if it weren't for people like you committed to leading the fight at the international level and giving encouragement and support uh, to everyone else um, at, uh, at, at various, um, in various countries around the world, the 80 nations uh, represented uh, in this room. It's a great honor for me uh, to be here uh, and, and, and to uh, describe and explain um, what we're up to in the work um, on business and, and human rights. So I'll say a few words um, about the, the mandate and where we stand today, and then I'd like to take a few minutes to suggest how this uh, might relate to the work that you do as national um, human rights um, institutions. Um, we, without sounding grandiose, um, the business and human rights interface um, is, is a historic challenge. Um, it's not something that is going to be dealt with fully in the short run. What we need to do is to make sure that the foundations that we lay, think of it as building a house. You start with very solid foundations and you build brick by brick. And what we're attempting to do is to establish very solid foundations, knowing that a house does not consist of foundations alone. Uh, you need also the superstructure, but you don't start with the roof, you start with the foundations. And that's what we have been trying to do. The challenge is, um, as, as, as has already been suggested to some extent, is there, there is a, a misalignment. Um, economic forces and economic actors, their scope, their influence, their ability to affect our daily lives has grown enormously over the last decades. As part of globalization, as part of privatization, as part of various other adjustments in the relationships between states and markets. The adaptive society, the, the adaptive capacity of societies has not kept pace. Our ability to govern these changes has not kept pace. And so you have a growing misalignment between the, 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 the scope and influence of economic forces and actors on the one hand and the governance uh, and adaptive capacity of societies on the other hand. This is true globally, it's true domestically. No country on the face of the planet uh, is exempt from this dynamic. And we've seen it in the recent financial crisis, for example, where the, 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 the risk of um, uh, investments uh, that private actors made, the risks were externalized onto societies, whereas the benefits were accrued by the, by the institutions that took the risks, in many cases knowing that they would be externalized onto society. Our job is to create better alignment between those forces uh, and, and, and factors. And human rights is at the core, because human rights uh, ultimately um, it reflects the, 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 the deepest aspirations of societies um, for fulfilling the fundamental dignity uh, of individuals. Business is growing in importance. It contributes positively to human rights. We must not forget that. Businesses create jobs. Businesses uh, require property rights. Property rights require a rule of law, et cetera, et cetera. Businesses contribute to the realization of human rights. But at the same time, as I've suggested, there is 
a misalignment as well, which needs to be rectified. We see it uh, in a number of ways. Uh, the, the most visible um, um, that, that, that many human rights activists focus on, of course, are transnational corporations or complex supply chains. But it happens at the national level as well. It isn't simply a phenomenon related to transnational corporations. So in 2005, the uh, then Commission on Human Rights asked the Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan at the time, to appoint a special representative, initially with a very modest mandate, to identify and clarify identify existing standards and how they might apply, clarify certain basic concepts like what is the corporate complicity, what is the meaning of corporate complicity in human rights abuses? What is, is there a prevailing international legal understanding? Uh, and, and if so, what is it and how does it apply to different situations? So it was very much an analytical fact-finding um, a mandate at the outset, but it soon grew to more than that. We supplied the, first the Commission and then the Human Rights Council with voluminous uh, work, research, um, on the various issues that they were interested in. What, 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 what duties apply to companies under international law, if any? Are companies exempt from international human rights standards because they are not subject directly to most international treaty instruments, for example, only indirectly through states that have ratified them um, in uh, the countries in which companies operate. So we, we supplied the human rights machinery with a great deal of documentation, uh, and they found it useful, and then they said, all right, um, would you take another year and come back with some recommendations? Having laid, laid out what the basic um, uh, facts of the matter are, uh, you've indicated there are these gaps and misalignments. Uh, would, you, would you make uh, some recommendations? And I think what they expected was for us to come back with a list of, I don't know, 112 recommendations. You should do this here, you should do that there, and you should do the third thing over there, and we didn't do that. We said, you know, what we need most of all is conceptual and policy coherence. We need a framework within which we can pull all of this together in a, in a comprehensible way so that we don't simply have fragments of activities, that they actually add up and build on each other. So what I, I only made one recommendation to the Human Rights Council in 2008, namely that it endorse what I called a policy framework that I put forward that then it would have the imprimatur of the Human Rights Council and would become um, a basis for, a foundation for, further clarification and elaboration. This framework, um, the Council um, was unanimous um, in endorsing it. And interestingly enough, this, is, this was the first time that the Human Rights Council or its predecessor body had ever taken a substantive policy decision on the area of business and human rights. It had never taken one before. All previous decisions were procedural. We have endorsement, unanimous endorsement, of a policy framework. The policy framework, as has already been mentioned, rests on three pillars, as we call it, which we derived from our research and our extensive consultations on every continent. The first is the state duty to protect against human rights abuses by third parties, including business. States, by virtue of adopting human rights treaties, by virtue of being the, the trustees, if you will, of the international human rights regime, have a duty to protect against abuse. Not only abuse that they cause, or are related to, but abuse caused by others. Every treaty instrument has a clause in it that the state parties agree to ensure the enjoyment of the rights. Well, you can't ensure the enjoyment of the rights unless you protect against the abuse of the rights. So states have a legal duty under international treaties, and there are policy rationales why states should uh, quite apart from that, exercise 
a duty to protect against human rights abuses by third parties, including business. And you do that, as always, through appropriate policies, regulation, and adjudication. The problem is that many states, and I would say perhaps the majority of states, don't fully realize the implications of this duty. So ev virtually everybody in the world, virtually every country in the world has adopted labor laws and it has a labor ministry and this, that, and the other thing. But the systemic challenge of business, um, re uh, corporate cultures respectful of human rights and what governments need to do to, in to, to encourage and facilitate that is very poorly understood. So one of the jobs that, that, that we've undertaken is to spell out to states what the implications are of their duty to protect against human rights abuses. The um, second pillar um, in this framework is an independent corporate responsibility to respect human rights. Now, when I say independent, I mean it exists and it is effective no matter what the state in which a company is operating does. It doesn't matter if a company operates in a country that hasn't adopted a certain international human rights standard. The corporate responsibility is to respect human rights as recognized internationally. 